Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on our first video podcast. It was awesome to get Aaron and Connor in here. Uh, both of my business partners, both awesome baseball guys. Usually on these videos and stuff, it's just me, you know, yapping about a bunch of stuff. So it was good to get all three of us in the room and talking about different concepts and hitting and, and just the game in general. So I really enjoyed this one. I hope you guys do too. Um, just a quick little intro so you know you know, who these guys are, right? So me, okay, I'm Kurt Hughes. I started Ignite Baseball in 2016. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this for a long time um, and been talking about the sport for a long time. If this is your first time joining us, thanks so much. Um, another guy on the podcast, he's going to be all the way on the left, okay? That's Aaron, okay? Aaron Tarr. He's my business partner. Um, he is uh, just finished up uh, coaching college baseball, uh, he was at the Mount St. Ma or Mount St. Mary's for the last couple years. Prior to that, he was at Coppin State. And then uh, prior to that, he was at Georgetown University. Um, and then before that, he coached at Marshall High School for a bunch of years. And then he was the JV coach at Yorktown for a couple of years as well. So he's coached baseball at a lot of levels for a lot of years, uh, like about 20 years. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this stuff. And he's a great guy to talk baseball with and learn from. Um, Connor, um, he's another one of my business partners. He has, uh, been working for Ignite for three years. He played for coach Tar, uh, when he was at Coppin state. That's how we got introduced. Connor is one of the sharpest baseball people that I've already, ever been around. Um, and in particular, he knows a ton about hitting and is excellent at communicating it. If you just talk to him for literally like five minutes, you, you know, are able to, discover how much he actually does know about the game and how researched he is on this stuff. He is awesome. And I hope you guys enjoy listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Yeah. I always, I always tell kids this. I always tell kids this. I always tell kids this. This is a funny quote. If I had, I, you know, every, everyone's so bad that if I did my best all the time, there'd be nobody left to play. You know what I mean? So sometimes you have to go over four with four strikeouts. You know what I mean? So they, so they keep coming back to play, you know. Yeah, I remember. You can't, you can't the, just I all. You were that happy about doing that. So <laughs> you, you can't. Know. You can't just. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can't just. You can't just all the time. There was that kid um, when we played. When we played at Gardner Webb's Field, but we didn't play Gardner Webb. You weren't there yet. I was not there yet. Um, I can't remember the team he played. He, he threw like 102. Um, Citadel. Citadel. No, it wasn't Citadel. We played Citadel at Citadel that year. Citadel had some arms, though. They um, did. Citadel had some good arms. Um, yeah, I was during the COVID year. I had to catch that game, even though I hadn't caught all fall, because I was told I wasn't going to catch. And, you... then, and then Cole Marula was sick, so then I had to catch. Um, hadn't caught in six you know, six months or something like that, not even a bullpen. So I, I caught, and I, this kid was, I, I don't know, he's he doing like 102. That wasn't really the issue, though. The slider was pretty good. But I still remember the at-bat, like, pretty good. Like, I don't know, he threw, like, one away. And um, one of our pitchers in this, Aaron Ray was in the stands, and he, the guy next to him had a radar gun, and Aaron was like, that, that was 102. He kind of told me that from the stands. And I was like, well, it doesn't really look 102. And then he threw, like, one under my chin, and that kind of, Looked a little bit more like 102. No, it, it still didn't look like crazy fast. The the, the problem was like 2-0, he tried to throw this. The slider was really good. That's what I remember from it. Not that it was like it looked incredibly hard. Um, the slider was pretty good. And then I, I hit a fastball back up the middle that like almost hit him in the head uh, in, for a single. But um, that kid was probably the hardest thrower I've ever faced. Um, you faced when we played Lehigh. That kid was pretty good. He just made his debut for the Giants. I, I grounded out twice to the second baseman off of him. But what, what the issue was is is I wanted um, to look for a fastball in, but Aaron told me to look not, not to look there. And then the first pitch was a fastball in, and then I turned around to the dugout, and Aaron was laughing. So that, that was funny. Um, you, you're going to look for the fastball in at 97. That's, I don't, I, it was like... 35 degrees. I'm not betting on you to get that ball. What 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 I remember about that series is that was before I come in and done some four move work. So I wasn't really hitting all that great. And two, the sun was going down in center field. Yeah. Remember that? And we like switch fields. It, <laughs> it, it was rough because that kid had hit 100 in the summertime, and there were like 30 scouts there to see him. Right? It was like a. I thought it was closer to like 50 or 60. Yeah, it was a lot. There were a lot of guys it there. Was, I mean, kid went in the second. 
and then he just he, debuted for the Giants last and, and, couple weeks ago. And he <laughs> threw seventy five percent off speed because he was trying to show people that he had improved. He's doing a lot of off speed, speed stuff. I, I thought it was it was it was good. Um, I don't know if I've ever faced Blake before. What was his name? I can't remember his name. Mason Black. Mason Black. Black. Mason Black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I ever faced Blake Snell. I I, I caught him quite a bit. I don't know if I ever faced him. I can't remember when I was at my junior college. Um, That would probably be the best pitcher I've ever faced if I had faced him. I can't remember if I got that bad or not. Um, Where did he play in junior college? His dad was my head coach. Oh, I gotcha. Um, So Blake would come back. What makes makes Snell so good? Oh, I always thought Blake, like right before he won that first Cy Young, um, the year before he won that first Cy Young, he was a bit of a ball show. But that second year, I caught him when he he, he was up and down at the start of the year. But I thought his fastball command got a lot better. Um, I thought he had a lot of like when I was catching him, whenever you, you know you catch a lefty and you're kind of catching a lot of stuff off of that left knee, that just shows a lot of kind of inward angle on that fastball. And he's just spotting that a lot better. Had a really good action to it. And I think a lot of times when you see guys make jumps like that, is the fastball gets a lot better. Um, and you know that he, he went on to win a Cy Young that year. And and I think over his career, you've seen when the control is really good, he pitches really well. Um, you know, second Cy Young, that type of stuff. But I thought that he had spent a lot of time throwing a lot of fastballs to me, kind of off over that off season. And I thought the command of the fastball got a lot better. Um, secondary pitches are always pretty nasty, right? I mean, just thought the fastball command got a lot better. Um, Kurt, what do you think is the best way to prepare yourself to hit off a lefty hit that has really good stuff? I mean, you gotta make sure your timing's on point for sure. Um, so you gotta do that work, you know, in the on-deck circle um, and when you're in the hole. Um, I mean, it really just depends on kind of how that, how that lefty's trying to get you out. Uh, you know, some guys are horizontal guys that are trying to move the ball, ball with a two seam and a slider. And other guys are more like vertical guys that are more like a four seam, 12, six. So, I mean, that, that's not really like lefty, you know, specific, but you know, things like that are really important to consider, um, when you're going into those at bats so that way you can design your approach in a way that's actually functional so you can kind of eliminate pitches that um might be hard to hit um so if a guy's like really high spin four seam guy with like a 12 six like probably not going to try to hit that high four seam at the very top of the zone um because it's just going to get higher and higher the more more that um that it comes in you know you're going to think it's at you know top you know your ribs and it ends up at your chin and then um then you miss so um you might for high, a four seam guy um 12 six guy you might be trying to attack a little bit more low in the zone so you can hit more of his mistake fastballs than his best fastball and then at that point you can then be able to attack um his off speed as well which is usually going to be vertically breaking down so um, whereas with your with your horizontal guys, you might split the plate a different way and, and, and attack it differently. Um, Aaron, did you have any thoughts on? on yeah, that? I mean, I don't. I wouldn't. <clears throat> no, I mean, you think a little bit about handedness when you're thinking about what it is that a pitcher does, right? That because it plays a role in all that sort of stuff. But there definitely isn't a standard to all lefties. Like I think you. You need to figure out exactly. There's a big difference between high slot lefties and low wide slot lefties, or guys who don't, or lefties that don't stay on line. Like a, I can't even think of a, a Chris Sale. A, a, yeah, or like a Ross Detweiler back in the day, right? He always used to like his stride would take him to a crossover position. So Chris Sale He'd does. come around yeah. at like three quarters, so he's coming like really wide with that, like Randy Johnson, something like that, yeah. right? So there's like angles that you have to get used to and they inform the way that the ball moves, right? They inform how, like what you're going to expect out of the pitch movement, but they're not, it's, it's not everything. I think the, in terms of preparation, like those are just things that you want to see in the days leading up to seeing that pitcher, but mostly being conscious of what it is that a guy does best and what it is that you can take away from him 
is really the important bit. And then, of course, from a... Can you talk more about that, taking away from him? Because I think that that's yeah, kind of under-talked like, about. I mean, like... Like... Who is it? Do you mean, like, like, like where he's trying to get you out, trying to take that away? Because like, we used to talk a lot are, about there that. There are places that you cannot hit certain pitchers. Exactly. Right? Like, the, the force... Garrett, hit, Garrett Cole, you're never going to try to go to the top of the zone with him because he's going to beat you every time. 100%. You're going to bring him down in the zone. So you have no business even attempting to do the thing, even if it's something that you do well... Because he doesn't lose that battle. Like, and statistically, he just doesn't lose the battle. So why are you going to do it? So from a training perspective, like, so with each pitcher, you're trying to uh, figure out, like, what is it that they want to do? What is it that they want to get to? And then what's that thing that they've got that makes them, puts them on the mound? Like, why the heck are they good? Right? Like, why why are they effective? Because it's, it typically revolves around one major thing, and then a bunch of other stuff. And the major thing, you have to take away from them. You cannot try to go at that thing, which means you, means you as a hitter have to be movement capably and approach capably um, able to adjust to a lot of different stuff, right? From the movement standpoint, like there are certain guys that cannot execute certain swings and that becomes problematic if that fits in a puzzle poorly with what it is that a pitcher does exceptionally well, right? Like So like barrel under your hands versus barrel around sure. your hands. So That's people a, could kind of do both, but like most people kind of fall into one archetype. A hundred percent. And then I would say that they're like, even though, so we use the Garrett Cole example, right? As a guy who's got like a ton of ride high, and carry at the top of the zone. High, high spin. There are still hitters though, that, that I've had in the last couple of years that I would say, yeah, you go ahead and hit that pitch. Well, I Even think you see that. I think you see that because what hurts Garrett Cole, it's, it's home run. So when you do try to make that battle at the top of the zone, sometimes you get lucky and you're able to run the ball out of the yard. But I feel like from your perspective, you know, coaching in college, that's almost like a, a team makeup to a certain degree. Like, are, are you okay with that? Are you okay with trying to go to the top of the zone and battle him there? With because it could, but with certain guys, because it could result in the home run. Is, are you okay with that? Is your coaching staff okay with that? Cause it might lead to more strikeouts. Well, I, well, I think, no, what, what, no, no, I think no. what he's saying is that, is that certain swing archetypes. Sure. And, if and, a guy's flatter with his barrel, you want him to do that. A hundred percent. Because I'm, I'm telling you, there are guys that like, even but, uh, a, even against a guy who like wins that battle ninety five percent of the time, the guys that are going to get them fifty like beat that. It's a gamble, is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a gamble at the top of the zone. Sure, damn thing is sure. Gamble. I'm saying if a guy's flatter and trying to go after Garrett Cole at the top of the zone, he might run into some more home runs. He's or hits in general, right? Sure. Guys who keep the barrel high at the beginning are going to have more success on those people than the guys that want to get the barrel below their hands. My, like, so my, just let those guys. Those guys have to take the pitch. Have to. And I, I, I guess my my what I'm trying to say is you look at a guy like Juan Soto who's flat with the barrel. He doesn't really swing at too many pitches up in the zone. Yeah, that's kind of what I like. He doesn't really gamble and, and attack the top of the zone as much. I wouldn't. Have, for me, I would not necessarily have said Juan Soto's flat with. The yeah, barrel. I wouldn't call him flat in the in the in the uh, like. Amateur baseball definition, like he's probably flat by the major league definition. Yeah, right, right. right. He's not as he's not as. Um, I want you to go back two years ago and watch him in that home run derby he did. Mm-hmm. Okay. So any ball, okay, maybe flat or vertical with his barrel. Sure, sure. Go back and watch that home run derby. Any ball that was up, he hit pound in the ground. No, opposite. He, oh, he only, oh, only could get up. the ball out of the yard when it was up. When it was up. Okay. Why, why would that be? I think there's a, a very obvious reason for that. First of all, he's taking BP practice, right? What's the angle of the ball coming in? Sure. I, 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 see, what, I see what you're saying. So he's I, still got a little bit more. Like I, I think that helped him in that context. It's a slower pitch, and it would have helped him in that context because he's – more on the flat side. That's that's what I'm trying to say. In He's major, more on the flat side. Major leaguers tend between like a 10, 10 degree and 18 degree uphill swing. He's going to be like on the 10 level there. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right? 8 to 10, yeah. And, but he's not going to be at the top of that. 
So yeah, but he he can probably get some stuff up, but he but there's Juan Soto's doing a lot of stuff in his at bats that aren't about like trying to play that odd in the most dangerous version possible. He may not want to go up at that ball because he's worried that it'll he also cause does him to a great the zone, job. He never wants to do. He also does a really good job of differentiating between balls and strikes at the top. Of the yeah, he's the, mm-hmm. he's the that would be my pushback. Best. That would be my pushback on my. Right. First so argument. like he, he may that may be like a, a a perceptual avoidance thing. Like he doesn't want to get into a game where he's and I would say that there are guys who like if you get flat guys at the top of the zone that are prone to following guys up the ladder, like to their eyes, you may not want to open up that can of worms by saying, Hey, go attack that pitch at the top of the zone because if they don't get the first one that guy can keep walking them further out of the zone to a point where they can't actually hit the ball. And most of the guys that I know that 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 start high have a tendency to like have a good feel for where that top edge is, and they don't try to go above it. But there's going to be some guys that break that rule. Who would you in the major leagues? Who would you call someone that that's 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 flat? Can we define what flat is? I think we're kind of getting a little bit like crossed up. Like, it's a, there's a big difference between image or flat. There's attack. There's a, there's attack angle flat, and there's vertical bat angle flat. Which one are we talking about? I'm talking about vertical vertical bat angle. Okay. I think Aaron was kind of talking, about, Aaron attack was talking angle. about attack angle. Yeah. And I think that there's a little bit of a distinction there. Like if you're if you're attack angle flat, then yeah, top of the zone, you're definitely gonna do better for sure than low in the zone. But you can also have a pretty significant vertical bat angle and still be like still have a pretty low attack angle if that makes sense so yeah, it's yeah. like you know i was talking about with soto just that that vertical batting was a little bit flatter that, I, that's kind of what i, I was think, getting yeah at. I, I would agree with that i still think that there's a difference between like he still has a vertical bat angle that's significant relative to you know like sure some kids on my 13 u team probably some kids that you coached in college right no no, no, no for sure for sure flatter. i was just saying he's 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 more flat with that vertical bat angle which I think for him sometimes, you know, he has like 20 home runs or something right now. But like when, when you're a little bit flatter with that, maybe you have to run a little bit higher fly ball to home run rates to get to some of that power. That's sure. always been my thing with, with, with talking about Juan Soto. And it's more so kind of a joke more than anything because he's, he's hitting like – Because you take him on your fantasy team. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and then I can play. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He hits 120-mile-an-hour ground balls right at the second baseman. And, and right. I, I think it's funny to, to, to complain about it. Uh, but he's still hitting like – 303, you know, yeah. 305, 310, something like yeah. that. He's still got 20 home runs. Like, yeah. I just think it's kind of a fun <laughs> argument sometimes because I think when he's a little bit flatter with that vertical bat angle, you know, it leads to a little bit less strikeouts. Um, I think I think some of that getting too flat with that vertical bat angle has really diminished some guy's power. Totally. I think a real conversation is like Alex Bregman and those types of guys who sure. are pretty flat with that vertical bat angle and – how the power has kind of gone away for him. Um, that, that, it's more just, uh, just a that, conversation. That's the statistical reality of it is that guys who are <clears throat> high ride and carry are, are going to strike out. They're going to get higher percentage of swing and misses, but they're also going to give it more home runs. Yep. Guys who are flat with the barrel are going to be able, like, flat with more flat with the vertical bat angle mm-hmm. are going to are going to strike out at a much lower rate, yep. Yep. but they're not going to have the power numbers. Ooh, it's ooh. very hard. That, that's that's, that. that's more so what I like about or the Joey conversation Votto's about Juan like Soto. The, the, the outlier who's kind of in the middle of all that stuff. Yeah. Where his strike that, that's more so low. where I like the conversation about the Soto thing to go to. Yeah. That That's more so why I bring it up sometimes. And yeah. I like a lot of the kids that we train are from D.C. They know Juan Soto, so then it's easy to talk to them when, you, yeah. when, you, when, I, when I start by saying Juan Soto – is a bad power hitter, you know, and they're like, "Well, why is that?" And then he, he gets, to, it's not actually true, but it's in your face, you know what yeah. I mean? Because I think who hits for, a, who you know, who's probably the best guy who hits the most home runs in baseball right now? Judge. Who gets that bat real vertical? Judge. You know? Yeah, so. right. But then what happens to the strikeouts? Sure. sure. Right. It's like yeah. One of the only guys to ever overcome, you know, that plus thirty percent strikeout rate. Judge, and I think his rookie year struck out like 34% of the time and still managed to hit. I mean, the rookie year is... Oh, are we calling his rookie year the rookie the year that he actually, like, played well? Or are we talking about a rookie year as in, like, 
the first time he got called up. Because when he first got called up, he was terrible. No, no, no. I'm talking all, about when he, well, that was like a, I'm talking his first full season, got I believe. Okay, cool. He yeah, struck yeah. out like 34% of the time, but still yeah. managed to hit yeah, it's, it's a bunch of home to, runs. It's hard to overcome. overcome kind of that yeah. plus 30. That 30% is kind of the cutoff. Yeah. What's even Sometimes. more difficult to overcome is when you have that percentage in the minor leagues. Sure. Because like they, they project out that you're going to raise that thing 5% each progressive yeah. level you go to. I also think minor leagues is a little funky right now because they're trying out different rules in the minor leagues too. And yeah, I also think there's the sure. I also think there's you know the minor leagues right now. There's a lot. Of, there's 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 a vastly different hitting environment in the minor leagues compared to MLB parks. Right? Does that make sense? Explain what you mean. Like Colorado that. is an outlier because of the elevation. Right? right? There's different leagues in the minor leagues that have even a greater discrepancy in their hitting no environment. You know, one of the leagues, the whatever league, the Pacific, Pacific. something is using a stickier ball Deer versus national. versus yeah. all MLB stadiums use a humidor now. All MLB stadiums are trying to use, have that humidity be in the same spot where they store the baseballs, but baseballs are handmade. So there is a bigger discrepancy baseball to baseball. And I think that plays a big factor in sometimes what you see year to year in the major leagues as well. You go back a couple years, everyone was hitting 30 home runs. You know what I mean? Alex Bregman hit like 40 with a flatter vertical bat angle because the ball was a little bit more reduced. You turn around this year, offense has been down a little bit. It's starting to come back around when the heat's up a little bit. You know, there's, there's different hitting factors for where, where you are is all I'm trying to get at. Sure. I think they, like, play development departments, or not the development side, but the the scouting side aggregates for that reality that there are certain they try to yeah i mean they they've got a a good sense of what the norms are in certain leagues like the like the pacific some teams do it better than others right i mean you can aggregate for the norm you still need to have good players right that's a draft signing issue Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is NIL, NIL a good thing or a bad thing, Uncle Tar? That's like, it's not even, I, I don't actually, I think most people who say it's a bad thing are um, like just digging in their heels on like something that is so dead at this point that it's not even worth discussing. Do you think the people who dig in their heels are the teams that... The haves and the haves nots, the teams that don't have want to dig in their heels. People yeah, that don't but have. An, but this is the thing, I don't really think it changes who the haves and have nots are. Sure. Right? Like it was always about football money in the first place. I think like I think the one thing that's good is players having it's good for players to have free outs out of situations that they don't they're not happy in. There is a downside to that though. In that, like, the the ability of coaches to hold players accountable in an environment where they also don't want the guy to leave gets a little dicey, right? Like, the, the, the power, power dynamic. To the players is like or little, powers with the coaches? Is it, is it player power or is it coach power, it's, right? that, it's not even remotely close. It's player, player. power. Yeah. The, the thing that You're seeing about, a lot of sports turn into that, though. But the thing that the, the, pro the level coach too. still has the power on is that he walks up every game and writes a lineup, right? Sure. That's the Phil Jackson motto, right? Like, the thing that I have is the lineup card, right? So, like, to that extent, he's still got that. But... Um, is there some is, instances... Is, 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 about, is a, a good thing. It's a good thing for... But it's also... Like, it's a good thing in the sense that, like, if teams are making money or there's revenue to be had, then the players should be getting, I think the players should be getting some aspect of it. I know guys say, like, their education, blah, 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 blah. I get all that, but um, you're talking about a lot of money, not, sure. not ed- like, the amount for your education. Now, with, with the money, that also brings in the transfer portal, right? Kids transferring out, stuff like that, right? Would you agree? That's had some effect? On what's had an effect on what? What's the cause? With effect? all the money being thrown around now and the pa- the players having so much power and the transfer portal being so much more wide open, you see a lot of people jumping to team to team to team. Sure. And I feel like that re- that also trickles down and affects recruiting a ton. Yeah. 100%. Oh, yeah. Right? Do you feel like that 
is having a negative effect on the high school kids that are trying to be recruited? If they think that coming out of high school, they should get to go to like the biggest school possible, then yes, it's having a negative effect on them. Okay. If they think they should go to college and play, it's not going to have a negative effect on them. There's the, 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 the talent pool still is finite. Sure. Right. There's still, and it's a lot of kids, right? My, my thing would be always like, like you'll still hear high school guys want to do the, the classic thing that kids did like 10 years ago where they're like, I want to go to name big, huge program. LSU. It's, they need to just for five seconds, look at how many guys made it to the spring out of, out of their LSU freshman year. Because the number is going to be like two out of 25, right? And that's going to be pretty much standard at all of those size schools because like freshmen are not going to be as good as if you have access to the entire pool of players in all of America, there's, it's going to have to be a really special player for you to put them on the field. Right. Usually so those special go, players get drafted too, right? Yeah, and special players get drafted. Although I think you're going to see it affect the draft because guys... Sure, because they can make the money in, in college. Because right? there's going to be players that decide that they can go to college and ma- and get an education and make the money and like and basically have those aspects of what they would have... If you go to... Obviously, if you go to the pros, you're like... You're 18 and you're in low A ball and like the general life quality is pretty bad even though the money you're making is probably pretty good like you can have the typical collegiate experience and make the money and kind of meld all those things together i'd almost argue that even if you're a first rounder and you have all that money the there's a lot of guys who get drafted who play in, in low and, and they have horrible living situations right yeah so let's say you're a guy who might get taken in the 10th round Right, a tenth rounder who might get a couple hundred thousand dollars if he goes and signs for the A's or something and that draft him. Okay, if he has an opportunity to go to insert other big name school, right? Maybe he's not going to get money right away from the from the pot, right? But he's going to have better living conditions. He's going to have probably better development at some of those bigger schools than in low A somewhere, no and. Look at the kid from Georgia right now who's hitting all the home runs. He's going to go in the first round. You can play yourself into getting more of that money. So you can play yourself into getting more of that money. You'll be in a better situation. You'll be getting a better education. No doubt. So all these kids who care about how they're being recruited out of high school, go somewhere where you're going to play and play yourself in that situation. That's what I have. Because the considerations for recruitment and the considerations for who gets NIL money are not the same thing. Yep. It's not That's number right, yeah. of tools. It's not number of like when you're recruiting guys. It's like, does this guy have size? Does he? Do we think he can play at this speed? Blah 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 blah. Once you get into, once you like punch your card, your ticket to some level of college baseball, it's what you do, and that's the only thing that matters. So for all these guys who, it's actually like phenomenal for these guys who come out of high school that's really hard for college coaches to assess like they're just ballers right they're great they're skilled players they just get things done they have intangibles that nobody can quite measure but they don't tick the boxes from like size speed strength all that kind of stuff they're just great players Mm -hmm. just go where like those guys are never going to get recruited by division one schools they get constantly overlooked by division one schools but now they can just go play somewhere hit 400 and end up getting NIL money to a division one school. Boom, boom, yep. super fast. Like what there was a, a power five school two years ago that their three starting pitchers, none of them threw over 84 miles an hour. How does that happen? It only happens. None of those guys are, those guys don't get recruited out of high school. They go, they get, they play at, some level they absolutely put up numbers and people are like we don't understand why these guys are great they don't throw hard they don't do any of the typical stuff that we care about but they get great. out so they get out and that, that's always been my thing i'll take you 
Yeah. I feel like that's what I was trying to get to is go where you're going to play. 100%. I, don't turn down the junior college. Don't turn down the D- Division two, II, Division three, whatever, right? Go where you're going to play, and you can play yourself into some yeah, special if, situations. If you're, if you're a high school kid, you can't – and you Can't be turning your nose. And you turn your nose up at, like, any opportunity, you're – you're really playing with fire. Like it's not the the, the number of opportunities are just so small yep. for, for guys coming out of high school. I think I think this the group of high school kids now is like learning that lesson more directly than it's always it's been the case for the last two or three years, but I think they're learning the lesson more directly because just many fewer College coaches are actually going to the games. Yeah. They're just not going to the. They're just not going to the high school games. Why? Because we. Because you have to like run around and find fifteen guys to put on your roster. They're going through the, the portal. Ball. Yeah, they're going through like, the portal. Yeah. I mean, so how does that? You know, so that kind of brings me to my next thing. How does that affect high school baseball? How does that affect high school? Because you don't have as many people there at the games. So, yeah. Is there a reason to play high school baseball? High school, uh, you, high school baseball or high school? The reason to play high school baseball is to play for your school and kick some butt with your boys. Sure. Like, that's got nothing to do. There's no connection to. Is to, your time spent? It, is there places to spend your time that are better? You mean in showcase baseball. That's what you mean. Insert whatever. I'm just talking at the high school level. This is going to trickle down. High school and age. We're already seeing it. Sure. Sure. It, it matters. Like, I mean. Because I, I, my, 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 my thing, right? We talked about this before when I saw you maybe a couple months ago. This is not what I think is going to happen. But is there a world where high school baseball doesn't exist? No. No. Because high school baseball doesn't exist for the reason that you're suggesting. That, that's, you're suggesting it's got a rec- it's a yeah, recruitment tool. It's I don't a think terrible it has, recruitment tool. I don't think it you has can't for go a long out to time. High school games anyways. Because you're playing. Because we're playing games. We have 55 games. They're happening at the same time as the high school games. High school baseball is going to be completely unaffected. High school showcase baseball. Okay. Summer stuff. I'm not yeah. saying that was. That, I'm not saying I thought that was going to happen. I just wanted to get your opinion on There's that. Like to the to, to the to, extreme of could it affect high school baseball in such a way where it ceased to exist? You okay. just have to divide. Did any of those kids that won a state championship at any point were they thinking of for McLean? Did, were any of them thinking about their recruitment no. in the moment? No, no, because that's just not what you think about. Like no, nobody's nobody's going to think about their recruitment in the context could it, of high school baseball. Could it? So we're talking about showcase baseball. Could it put more of an emphasis on training rather than showcase stuff? Uh, Depends on who you are. Yeah. Sure. Right? Sure. I mean, yeah, if I, you're one of those dudes that are like a baller that you were saying, but you can't quantify stuff, then what do you do to try to get yourself like seen better? Is that you try to improve your measurables so that way you potentially could check those boxes and then maybe reach whatever goal you're looking for. But if I, you're I, I think that I think it's all right. I, no, you're good. I think the thing that that it, it, if what I'm suggesting plays out this way and this is a like I, everything should be prefaced by saying that the rules change like every freaking month. So like if you it's predicting what something's going to happen like five years down the line. I don't know if anybody could have predicted this from five years ago. I don't know if you can predict how like the rules are going to shift that changes the dynamics. But if let's say the world exit that it is today and the rules as they are continues to every keeps operating in the same way for the next five years. Sure. Then I think you're probably like, it does look like the big showcase tournaments, the ones with like 300 teams and that kind of thing, are going to kind of dwindle. They're just going to dwindle in importance. And the things that are going to end up being more important are like, I mean, if I'm a high school kid right now and, I'm a, and I think I'm a good player and I think I can play at a collegiate level and I'm only asking myself the question, can I play in college? Not the way the kids want to ask themselves, am I D1 player? Am I a power five player? Don't ask that question. It's a, bu- it's a dumb question. Don't, don't do it. And can I play in college at some level? Then I'm identifying the same way that I would if I had like a 3.8 GPA and I was kind of a tweener between a bunch, like 
you do it like you do academically where you're like this is kind of my reach school this is kind of like my middle this is kind of the bottom the reach school cannot be lsu it can't be sec like realistically how many how many high school kids should write an sec or acc school down as their reach school in the whole country a hundred and it's out of not, those hundred, how many are first rounders or second yeah, rounders? Gonna, or, yeah, a whole a big chunk, a big chunk of them are going to be that. Like, if if uh, to me, the high school kids should be all like taking care of themselves a- academically, and then trying to go play baseball at like D two, D three, or junior colleges, like NAIA. If you live in an area where that's like a a thing. Um, and if you're awesome and you do great, then there you go. You that, want you immediately. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, like, the, the market, especially, like, for pitchers, like, is, is an 85 to 87 mile an hour high school guy getting picked up by a D1 school? Like, probably not, unless there's six, seven, and whatever. Like, unless there's some, but do those guys get signed at a D3 all the time to go D1? All the time. A hundred percent. A hundred percent because they've got because they had three point two ERAs in a, in a season of you know of a D three ball like people think that guy's going to be functional on their staff if you can get outs at D three like you might not get it as easily at D one but you're going to get outs yeah. right a lot of innings to cover yeah man a hundred percent it just makes a safer bet for schools yeah. when yeah. they're thinking about how to do that stuff. And then I think I'd be I would 100 percent go D three right now. I mean I was a D three player anyway, so of course that's how I think. But you know, I think it also uh, like you know with the transfer portal, like when you look at these bigger schools, like it's hard for an 18 year old to compete against a 23 year old. Like that's the that's, whole point. Like it's it's like most of it's just kind of logical. Like people don't like it because I feel every like that's why it puts even more of an emphasis on. Freaking, I feel like it puts even more of an emphasis from a training perspective on like. The physical stuff, getting in a weight room, getting stronger, that type of stuff, because that's like a five-year gap. You know the mean? emphasis like, has always been on just get good. Not not but just get they, good. I'm saying physically, you have to be at a certain. Sure, those are those are connected. Sure. If you don't think that the they, yeah, they're connected. I'm saying like yeah. a skilled player, like what you're talking about. Skilled versus explosive. Yeah, like like. You got to try. You've always had to spend time in that weight room, but I feel like sometimes there's a disconnect between that with some of the high school guys as they don't put as much emphasis on that is all I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. I, but yeah, I think that's, um, uh, I think no, people don't um, think that way. They don't think, think about like travel baseball and all that stuff. It's divided by age. When you get to college, that age, when you get to high school, it doesn't matter as much, but people still kind of put it up, that label on it. Like, by age group but when you get to college it expands even more and then when you talk about professional baseball it expands that's the kind of thing if you think about it that's bizarre about it in it's not the same in every area of the country right in some some areas of the country like the high school baseball team the 18 guys on the roster are going to be on the varsity roster are going to be freshmen to seniors because it's like it's not a populated area all that kind of stuff in this area to make a varsity roster as a freshman in high school, you would have to be like a dude, yeah. right? You have to, those are dudes who do that. It happens. Yeah. It happens probably to a guy or two a year, but you have to be a dude. When guys get to college, they like lose their sense of that understood hierarchy. And they're like, I'm a freshman. Why aren't I playing? Or like, why don't these people want me to come in and play immediately as freshmen? And it's for the same reason that that was the case when you were in high school. You are underdeveloped relative to the rest of the guys that you have to play against. I feel like what you don't understand is how much that opens up. I mean, 18, I mean, what's the oldest guy in college baseball right now? 24, 25? Uh, I, I, it's probably older than that. I mean, you just got, there have to be guys in D1 that are like 26, 27. Mm-hmm. I think there's some then, football players that are, that are yeah. up there. Dude, <laughs> right? like, yeah, so you even look at other sports, like, how is an 18-year-old supposed to... It just opens up. And that age gap keeps opening up. It's like, how is a 12-year-old or how is a 13-year-old supposed to compete with an 18-year-old in travel baseball? Right. right. They don't. Put the mic over your head. And, and I know, I know that's not necessarily 
you know, apples to apples or whatever. Because uh, no, I think it is. You think thirteen days? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's close enough. Sure, right, sure. The, the I think there's some physical the stuff with that, is like as a kid gone through puberty and that type of stuff, right? Sure. When you look at that age, right? But that's what I feel like kids don't understand sometimes is like, and I feel like outside of America, that's not the case. Kids who are 13, 14 compete at the highest level they can, regardless of age, depending on how good they are, right? I feel like you see that in the Dominican Republic, places like that. Would you guys? Yeah. You don't think so, Tar? I think you would probably have more knowledge about that. You're you're way more in like the the soccer world kind of thing than Tar's I. Tar's way more in the soccer world. <laughs> Both I'm saying from a perspective of like baseball five, and, and other and other places outside of the, of America. They they you hear stories about like guys like Jose Ramirez at 12 years old playing against. 28 year olds or 30. Yeah, but I, but I feel like someone like Jose Ramirez, right? Sure, that's like, a special is, guy. is like a very special baseball player. Yeah, I feel I'm like just saying they don't try, Gretzky. I'm yeah. just trying to like, say they don't divide by age. They don't try to put some sort of cap on it, is what I'm trying to say. But we don't. Well, I think you would make an argument that if you're, it's, if you're on a, if it's like, let's say the Dominican Republic and you, it's a maybe like an impoverished area or something like that, like, Maybe there's just not that much structured baseball. Thus, you just play baseball with whoever is around. Like sure. Wayne, like Wayne Gretzky with his buddies around, like that he used to play with all the eighteen year olds when he was twelve because they, they, was playing they, they needed a dude, another dude to play to make the numbers even. Right. Well, like, I'm just trying works. to. Right. Do you? I mean, why in America this is the only place where I feel like they put like a age cap on things? No, I don't think that's true. Like the d- development academies are structured by age. They'll let guys jump bits depending on like by age group, depending on if their skill level or physical development gets them to that. But like that's how we've always done things with cadets too. Is like no, we, no, we I, bounce I, guys up and down. Sure, I sure. Don't, I don't, I just think I just think people get wedded to that to that age structured system when they're in little league and then they easy to continue. And then they they forget they, it existed, but they have amnesia when they get to college. They yeah, just like they feel like they, they deserve to be playing immediately. They have a, okay. they have a vested interest in believing in the age <laughs> system, right? Because right. it benefits them, right? Right. So they don't like everybody's conscious of these other things. They just don't want to admit that they exist, right? You don't want to like you want to step on a field as a freshman and get playing time, despite the fact that you're completely conscious that it is like hard for you to get through consecutive practices with the guys on your team because they are you have to play at your absolute best to catch up yeah. to all these guys that are five years older than you mm-hmm. right like but you're not going to say that you're going to gotcha. still say i want to play right right so and that's the point is like you just i think if people would be more honest with themselves about what constitutes a real opportunity for them they would make better decisions about this stuff but they want to chase the thing that looks to everybody the best and like this is the hardest thing to discern i think is as for college coaches is which guys are really interested in being ball players and which guys are really interested in telling people that Posting they on are instagram ball players. <laughs> yeah that's it there's a big difference there is a big di- difference, and there's also like I've heard pro scouts talk about how part of their job is to discern the difference between a guy who wants to get drafted and a guy who wants to play pro ball. And there's a difference, mm-hmm. right? There are guys who want to get drafted, but they okay. don't really want to go be pro ball players. They don't right. want that existence. They know what that. They have some sense of what that's going to look like. Be able to say they've they been drafted. Have, yeah, they want to get drafted, take check, yeah. play season, done so. Yeah. Right. And that's why there's a lot of guys that are like that. Yeah. 